full disclosure, I have changed my mind on this subject. 10, probably, well, probably more than 10 years, 15 years ago, um, if you'd asked me, can women lead in church? I would have said, yes, but not in every role. We were doing a deep dive, doing a lot of study, a lot of reading as an LGBT, sharing books and resources and podcasts and messages. Uh, and then as a result of that study, that birthed this series. Does scripture teach that there are certain leadership roles reserved for men only based ex on the exclusive criteria of gender? Uh, my name is Johnny. Uh, I'm married to Tasha, who was playing guitar together. We've got the honour and the privilege of co-leading Liberty Church London. And uh, I'm excited because today I get to start a new teaching series. And I'm excited about that. It's, uh, it's the first time we've started a new teaching series because we're actually in the middle of another teaching series. We're going through the book of Luke currently. Uh, we started back in November going through the book of Luke. We're literally 25% of the way through. We're in Luke chapter six. There's 24 chapters in Luke. And we thought we'd take a break for a month. So we're excited to return to Luke. There's so much more to go. We're literally just getting started. Uh, but we thought we'd take a month out. And in this month of April, we would do a different series. And the series we're doing, as you can see on the screen, is Can Women Lead In? church can women lead in church and this is a conversation a topic which is much debated and has been for for hundreds and hundreds of years and we want to really dig in and see what the bible itself says so the the question says can women lead in church but that's the shortened version of the question really that's the version that is uh fits on instagram or goes in the title line, the subject line of an email. But the real question we're, we're trying to answer is this. It's, does scripture teach that there are certain leadership roles reserved for men only based ex on the exclusive criteria of gender? Let me read that again, because I think it's helpful to know this is what we're trying to answer over the next four weeks. Does scripture teach that there are certain leadership roles reserved for men only based on the exclusive criteria of gender. I mean, I don't want to spoil the series for you, but our answer is there aren't roles which are for men only based exclusively on gender. Or if we go back to the other question, it's, it's confusing because they've kind of got opposite answers. Uh, can women lead in church? Yes, that's the answer. But what we want to, what we want to do is unpack why we believe that. Because we're a Christian church. We're a Bible-believing church. We believe in uh, that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. We believe that what it says goes. And there are some passages some which are kind of tricky um, in, later on in the Bible, in, in Timothy and Corinthians. And we're going to address those passages because they seem to hint towards the opposite. Not even hints. They seem to go very much uh, towards the opposite. And we're going to take them head on in a few weeks' time. We're going to unpack them in detail in a few weeks' time. Um, but... We're going to start way at the beginning today, and we'll get there in a minute. Uh, I also want to get full disclosure. I have changed my mind on this subject. Ten, probably, well, probably more than 10 years, 15 years ago, um, if you'd asked me, can women lead in church, I would have said, yes, but not in every role. I would have said there were some roles reserved for men only. But I changed my mind. Uh, the reason I believe that is like, that was the church tradition I grew up in. That's what my friends believe. Some of my friends uh, lead churches who believe that and that's their stance on women in leadership but I actually I don't know when probably around 15 years ago read the bible from a different perspective rather than read taking those verses in Timothy and Corinthians and reading the bible using those verses as the lens to interpret the scripture from I actually took a step back and read scripture from not using those as a lens, but to holistically to see what the overall narrative, the continuous arc of Scripture says. I think it says something very different. But as I said, I don't want to spoil anything. That's in a few weeks' time we're going to get to those tricky passages. But I changed my mind, and uh, hopefully over the next four weeks you're going to see why. I also want to say at the start that everybody is welcome here at Liberty Church London. Whether you're watching online or you're in the room with us, you are welcome here. If your theological stance is different to ours, you are welcome here. This is a place where anyone can come. If you have a different theological stance on women leadership or whatever, you are welcome to come and join us and be part of the community. And I'd love to say if, if you're watching online or you're with us in the room and you're, you're opinion 
your understanding on what scripture teaches about the role of women in leadership uh, and your understanding is different to ours i'd love to encourage you to to sit back and try and try and approach this with an open mind and go well i want to learn what's taught here and hey you may not end up agreeing with us and that's okay but i'd love you to kind of don't be closed off to it just be open go okay god if this is what you if this is what you want to say through the bible i want to i want to hear what is taught does that make sense let's try and approach with an open mind and an open heart but even if you end up disagreeing you are still welcome to be here also want to highlight this isn't um we didn't just go, ah, oh, we need to do a teaching series. What should we talk about? Oh, this sounds good. Let's talk about women in leadership. Actually, uh, a group of us as elders, um, we started studying and reading and, and, and really digging deep into the topic of women in leadership last year, uh, way before we even had a plan to do a teaching series on it. So the study that we as an eldership began doing into the role of women in leadership and what the Bible says on women in leadership began last year and then it was as a result of that study we thought we should do this as a teaching series so it wasn't like hey we need to do something we need to fill a gap let's plug a gap with women in leadership it was we were doing a deep dive doing a lot of study a lot of reading as an eldership sharing books and resources and podcasts and messages uh, and then as a result of that study that birthed this series so this the series has come from our study there's a, there's a few things I think are really important to get clear, so uh, bear with me for a few more minutes. Um, right, when we are, st- oh yeah, here we go. You might be sat there going, but Johnny, what if you're wrong? You said that you believe that the Bible says women can be in leadership, but it appears in some parts of the Bible to say something very different. What if you're wrong? What if, what if your teaching isn't right? Well, in James uh, chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Paul's, uh, the, sorry, it says, not many of you should become teachers. This is talking about teachers of the Bible. Not many of you should become teachers, not geography teachers or history teachers, Bible teachers. My fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We're going to be judged by God by what we say. I'm going to be judged by God for what I say. As a teacher of the Bible, as a leader of this church, uh, alongside Tasha, I'm going to be judged by God. I believe that one day, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm going to have to stand in front of God. And I imagine he may ask me a load of questions and I'm going to have to give an account. And he might say, well, why did you teach this? And I'm going to have to say the reason why. And I'm going to be held to account for it. And so that is to say, I am confident through our study and through our preparation for this series that this is what the Bible says. I'm confident enough Uh, to stand up here with a microphone and on a live stream it's being recorded and say the bible says that women can be in leadership and i'm saying so with an awareness that one day i'm going to have to stand before god and give account for what i taught does that make sense so i believe this is what the bible says and i am confident i'm not arrogant enough to say that this is definitely what the bible says and anyone who says otherwise is is a heretic or a sinner that is absolutely not what I'm saying, but this, I feel in my role, in our role, leading this church community, that this is what the Bible says, and therefore, this is what we should teach. Now, as we go through this teaching series, there's three things that I want us to remember, okay? Uh, hopefully, these uh, will come up on the screen. The first thing is that God is unchanging. Therefore, we need to work out what the whole text of the Bible says on this topic, from the beginning through to the end. What was God's intention when it comes to leadership and gender? Secondly, we need to remember that we are not the original audience of the texts. And so we need to ensure that the texts we read are put into context historically and culturally. John Walton, who's an Old Testament scholar and professor emeritus at Wheaton College, he said, we believe that the Bible is written for us, that is for everyone of all times and places because it's God's written word. But it wasn't written to us. It was written in our la- it wasn't written in our language. It wasn't written with our culture in mind or our culture in view. Therefore, if we want to get the best benefit from the communication, we need to try and enter the world, hear it as the audience would have heard it, and as the author would have meant it, and read it on those terms. And thirdly, we need to remember that the Bible is about God interacting with a sinful and broken world. He's working within cultures that do not reflect him 
or his character, and that since the fall, he's working within our world to slowly reveal his character and truth. Because of this, we need to make sure that we pay close attention to variance. In times in the Bible, when God speaks in a way or acts in a way that is contrary to the cultural norms of the times, uh, sorry, let me read that part again. I'm reading this because I want to get it right, and I misread it, so I got it wrong. Uh, God speaks in a way or acts in a way that is contrary to our cultural norms or times. We need to ask why, because this is God revealing more of his true self, his true character, and his true plan. When, when we see variants, we need to pay attention. In short, we need to understand the scripture as a whole. Uh, to, we need to understand scripture as a whole, then use that to understand the tricky verses rather than using those tricky verses to understand the whole of scripture. You may have heard me make this terrible joke before, but I'll make it again. If we take the text out of context, all we're left with is a con. If we take text out of context, all we're left, we're left with in a con, is a con. So over the next few weeks, we're going to do a lot of work to try and put Scripture into context so we can exegete it correctly and understand what God is saying through it. Now, today, we are about to start what I'm going to talk about today because that, that was all preamble. Today, we're going to look specifically at Genesis, the very first book of the Bible in the Old Testament, and looking at Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And what we want to do uh, is ask the question, was there a hierarchy in gender roles before the fall, before sin took place? That's the question we're going to ask. And we're really going to try and dig in deep. Was there patriarchy before sin? Now, I'm not going to read one particular te teaching text today. We're going to go a lot in and out of different parts of the Bible. And usually at this church, when we read the teaching text, we invite everyone to stand. And we read the uh, I read the text out and then we pray. The reason we stand is so that uh, we remind ourselves the importance of the Bible and that it is God's authoritative word to us. We're not going to do that today, so I'm not going to get you to stand up. But I wanted to really make that clear. Uh, but before we, before we get into Genesis, let's pray. Father God, I just pray that you will speak to us today, that it will not be my words or my desires that will come through, but it will be your word and your heart for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, thank you. Okay, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Let me read this to you. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the, of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living creature that moves on the earth. Now, it's important that we know that the Hebrew word for man here is the word Adam. You've probably heard it. Uh, the word Adam, though, is not a, it's not a proper name. It's not a proper name unless it's used in context that way. The word Adam is actually a word used, generic term used for mankind, which is why uh, different translations, for example, in the NIV, it says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and likeness so that they may rule over the fish of, in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. It is The word Adam, though it is a name, uh, in, it's only a name in the specific context. And the context which it's used reveals whether it is a name or not. The context here is not a specific name. Let me make a guy called Adam in our image and likeness. It is, let us make mankind. And mankind stands for humankind, uh, all people. It isn't specific to one person or specific to one gender. Now, in this passage, you may have noticed something that the Bible says, uh, God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Now, this is interesting because right away we're seeing in this very first passage we're looking at, God reveals something about himself. He reveals his Trinitarian nature. Okay, so we believe that there's one God. 
There is one God. But God exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So one God, but who exists in three separate persons, who have different roles, who do different things. But there is one God. This is one of the most, to be honest, this is probably the most complicated part of Christianity to understand. And if I was writing it, I would have written it differently. But I didn't write it. God wrote it. And it's truth. And this is, this is how it is. So God exists in three separate persons. Now, oftentimes, though, when God talks about himself, he talks about himself in the singular because he's one God. But for some reason, he's chosen at this point to talk about himself using the plural, indicating the Trinity. Let me give you an example of a time uh, in Jeremiah 32, 38. Uh, he says, they will be my people and I will be their God. I just want to highlight that's the singular, right? He's talking about himself as in one. I will be their God. But here it's very clear that he talks about himself being more than one. He talks about let us make man in our image. And then it goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I wonder, I think the reason why God highlights, the scripture highlights God's Trinitarian nature here uh, is because it's going to move on and highlight the, the variance, the difference between man and woman in the next verse and show that God created man and woman in his image and likeness, but shows that his image actually exists in three separate persons. I will make man in, let, sorry, let us make man in, our image. The reason that the Trinitarian, the Trinity is revealed at this point is to highlight that human beings aren't just male. I read a quote the other day um, about saying that the Bible, it was about womanhood, says the Bible just says that woman was God's afterthought, that he hadn't thought about it, thought, oh, I best make best make a woman, I'll take a rib out of Adam. But actually, Genesis chapter one shows that's not the case. Woman is an afterthought. In fact, the the very the the fact that human beings are male and female is revealed right away in the first account of humans being created, and the the fact that they're male and female is actually mirrors and is in the likeness of God, who he himself exists as a Trinity. So the fact that we are male and female is to reflect the fact that God is a Trinity, and from that we can go further. Because God is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We know that it's one God, that, that each part of the trinity is equal. It, each part is equal. It has to be equal. God can't be one part of him more powerful and more important than another part of him. He is one God. He, therefore, the trinity has to be equal. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And so in this passage revealing that God created man and woman in his image and likeness, in order for us to actually reflect the trinity, to reflect who God is, we have to have equality between the male and female nature in which we created us. Does that all make sense? We have to have that equality. Otherwise, Otherwise, we're saying the likeness of God, to be like God, means that God is not equal. And the Trinity is not equal, but the Trinity is equal. God's nature is he is equal. He is one God. And to reflect that, male and female, at this point of creation, have to be equal. Also, uh, we were given the role to go forth and be multiply and be fruitful. And that couldn't happen all if we were on our own. So again, it's part of how God designed us was not to just be man, but to be man and woman. This is, again, points back to the fact God created us in his image and likeness. He gave us a role to rule over, over the world. Uh, and part of that was to go forth and multiply and multiplication required the male part of, and the female part of mankind. Both of those are key. Just like different parts of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have different roles Actually, male and female are necessary to fulfill what God has created us for. Now, the word for, uh, for rule over or subdue is the Hebrew word radar. Now, radar is, a, is the same word given to judges and kings, and it's actually used 27 times in the Old Testament. And uh, radar is absolutely key to us understanding uh, how God created us, because because it really does mean to rule over. Leviticus 26 verse 17 says, I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by, uh, so that you will be defeated by your enemies. 
Those who hate you will rule over you, radar over you, and you will flee even where no one is pursuing you. In 2 Chronicles 8 verse 10, it says, And others were chiefs of the officials of King Solomon, 250, who ruled over the people. Isaiah 41 verse 2 says, Who has stirred from... Uh, stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service. His hands, uh, he hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his blow. This word subdues kings, that's the word radar. So we were not only created male and female by God in his image, we were commissioned uh, with the purpose of ruling over or subduing the earth. And the word for subdue to rule, radar, it, it means authority. So all we know so far, if all we know about the Bible is the first chapter, and that's all we've read today, uh, if we haven't read on and read other things, all we know so far from the Bible about men and women is we were created in God's image and likeness. We were created male and female. As he is a trinity, we were created uh, male and female to exist. There's two different genders. And then uh, we were commissioned to rule. It wasn't Adam was commissioned to rule and a fe- uh, like the man was commissioned to rule and the female was commissioned not to rule. We were commissioned to rule. If all we know from uh, from Genesis about the creation of humans was was what we've read so far, we can see that there's absolutely no hierarchy yet. Can you see a hierarchy? I can't. There's no patriarchy in Genesis chapter 1. So let's move on to Genesis chapter 2. Um, are these, have we got these? Great, good stuff. I wasn't sure if we had the slides. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, 18 to 25 said, The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and the wild animals. But Adam, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he take the woman from a rib. He had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. I just want to zoom into verse 18 there. I want to read a couple of different versions of it just so we can pull something out. So I think we read the NIV version then. I'm just going to read uh, chapter 2, verse 18 in the ESV. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Then in Genesis 2, 18 in the NLT, it says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, this phrase, which is translated as suitable helper or helper fit for him or helper who is just right for him, is the Hebrew phrase, Eza Konegdo. This phrase is really key, so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about it. Eza Konegdo. So, Konegdo is a compound word. So, it's two separate words joined together. Ker, which means like, or Negdo, which means opposite or as opposed to or as opposed to or in front of so literally connecto means like as opposed to so it's it's about it's highlighting similarity and at the same time highlighting difference and in fact it's not just any difference it's an opposite difference which is interesting because uh eve woman was made uh is made the same species as man both humans But anatomically, is that right? Anatomically? Our anatomy is opposite. So equal to, like, but opposite, which is really key. It's equal to, but opposite. So this is clearly referring to woman. And then uh, the the other part of the phrase, Eza, that's where it gets, well, it gets even more tricky, right? Because Eza, what it means is helper. That's usually how it's translated as helper. Now, we, in the 21st century, in English, thousands and thousands of years later, when we read helper, I think we often think of, like, an assistant. 
we have the main, the, the star of the show and the support, best supporting actress or actor, right? We've got the, we've got the magician and the glamorous assistant. The helper is to help. We've got the CEO and then we've got the secretary. It, that's how often we read it. So when we read God made uh, man a, uh, a woman, uh, and he's a connecto, we think a helper, he's the, he's the main one and she is there to support him. That's often how we read it. And I think that, that's often where some of the problem comes from because that, that suggests a hierarchy. That suggests patriarchy. Man's first, she's second. He's in charge, she supports. Do you see that? However, we need to really dig into the word Isa. You see, because Isa does not mean glamorous assistance. The word Isa appears in the Bible quite a few times in the Old Testament. The person the word Isa describes the most out of everybody in the, in the Bible, the person that the word Isa describes the most is God. It's a word used to describe God time and time and time again. Let me read some to you because I think it's important that we know this. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 26 and 29 says, There is no one like the God of Je- uh, Jeshurun who hides on the heavens to help you. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. That word helper, the word help is Ezer. God is described as Ezer. Uh, Psalm 121 verses 1 and 2 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. The word help is easier. We see easier again. Uh, Psalm 33 verse 20 says, We wait in hope for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. He is our help. He is our easer, is what it says. I'm going to give us one more, because I think this is really important that we know this. Our house, uh, O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is the help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is the help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is the help and shield. Psalm 115, 9 to 11. The word help every time is easer. God is described as an easer. So when we're reading this and we read in English that God made a suitable helper for Adam and the helper was a woman, it can be very easily, if we only look at it at a surface level, do a surface level reading to go, ah, the Bible says that God made a woman for Adam to help him. Therefore, his role is to be in charge and her role is to help. But if the word help means that well, describes God. If the, if God is an easer, then that hierarchy cannot exist. It has to be well. It has to be a neutral word, because if God is helping man and it's a hierarchical word, that means man is more important than God, which we know isn't true. It's a neutral word. It does not depict a hierarchy. It does not depict one who's in charge and one who is less than. If it did, we'd have big problems because it's saying God is less than us, and that's not true. Easer does not mean that there is a glamorous assistance just coming alongside to support Adam. Robert Alter says uh, this is a notoriously difficult word to translate. It means something more powerful than just helper. It means lifesaver. I would say so far we're asking the question before sin. Um, was there a patriarchy? Was there a hierarchy uh, suggested by scripture that man was in charge and woman wasn't? I'd say no. We've not seen anything to suggest that when God created man and woman, he created one who was up here and one who was lower, one who was in charge and the other who was subordinate. I've not seen that at all. I don't think that exists in Scripture. So let's move on to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is where the fall happens. The fall is the word Christians often use, the, the phrase Christians use to describe when sin took place. Now, if you were here last week, it was Easter, and we were celebrating our Easter Sunday service. It was great. And uh, I talked about how God created human beings, man and woman, um, for relationship with him. I talked about how God had created the heavens and the earth and all the birds in the air and the fish in the sea and the animals and the trees and the donkeys and everything. And he created those differently to the way he created humans. He created humans for relationship with him. That was part of the design. And relationship requires choice. A relationship where someone hasn't got a choice is not relationship. 
Relationship requires choice. And it was the same if, with human beings, our relationship with God. God created us for a relationship with him. And in order for us to have a relationship with him, there had to be a choice made by those humans to choose to have relationship. And the choice in the story of Genesis, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, looks like a tree. You see, God, it says God created this paradise for Adam and Eve to live in. This paradise where they had everything they could ever want. It was beautiful, it was wonderful. And he even said in the, in the cool of the evening, God would walk with Adam and Eve. Just walk next to them. That was how close their relationship was. But the choice looked like the tree in the sense of the garden. God said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, except for the tree in the sense of the garden. Do not eat from that tree. That was an option. That was a choice. And they had that choice. It was only, it may seem like a small choice, but that was a choice. And they could either choose to walk with God and be in relationship with him and do what they were created to do, or they could choose to rebel against God. Guess what they chose to do? Uh, it says a, a serpent came along, a snake came along, who was, the, who was Satan, who was the devil, and uh, he tricked the first Eve into eating the tree, fr the fruit from the tree, and then she got told Adam to eat from the tree, which he did. Both Adam and Eve equally sinned. They did the thing they were told not not to do. God said, "Do not eat to both of them from this tree in the center of the garden." And both of them ate the fruit of the tree, and that was sin. Now, God, we need to understand this. God is holy. So we've talked about how God is a trinity, uh, but often called the Holy Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is holy. It's a nature of his, it's part of his nature, it's part of his character, it's who he is. And holiness and sin do not mix. Holiness and sin cannot coexist. Holiness hates sin and sin hates holiness. So when they sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, this relationship which they were created for, to be able to walk in the garden with God, it was ended. That could not happen anymore. They had to leave the garden and there were consequences to the sin. Um, in Isaiah, it says, your, and Isaiah 52 verse, 59 verse 2 says, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you, he will not hear. Our sin separated us from God. Adam and Eve were separated from God. And there were more consequences than simple separation. So I'm just going to read what those consequences were uh, for the sin which Adam and Eve did. It says this, to the woman, he said, this is God speaking, I will make you your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree about which I, about which I commanded you, you uh, commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground before you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until the return of the ground, uh, until you return to the ground, since from the ground you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, we've already mentioned how the word, Hebrew word Adam is, it, it means mankind, unless it's used specifically to refer to Adam as a person, then it becomes a proper name. Um, but this is interesting. The word Adam refers to mankind, to man. Uh, the word Adama refers to the ground. Why is that interesting? Well, because Alice Matthews, who's a theologian and former academic dean at Corden Conwell Theological Seminary, says this. It is in Genesis 3.16, God speaking to the woman, where we see hierarchy in human relationships. Hierarchy was not God's will for the first pair, but it was imposed when they chose to disregard his command and eat the forbidden fruit. Adam would now be, Adam would now be subject to his source, the ground, even as Eve was now subject to her source, Adam. This was the moment of the birth of patriarchy. As a result of their sin, the man was now master over the woman and the ground was now master over the man, contrary to God's original intention in creation. You see, the result of sin was that man became subject to the ground from where he came and woman became subject to man, which is where, from where she came. But then the rest of scripture from this point onwards is a different story. 
The rest of scripture, really from this point onwards, is a story of redemption. Because as I said, man and woman, we sinned. And that sin caused separation uh, between us and God. It separated us from God. But God didn't want it that way. God's plan was for us to be in relationship with him. And as we celebrated last week at Easter, uh, he did everything he could to rescue and redeem us so that we could once again be in relationship with him. Uh, I created a little little diagram, hopefully, to explain it. Is that there? Yes, there we go. Look at this beautiful diagram. This is, I mean, if you want to help with your artwork, come and, come and find me later. Okay. So here we have, at the start of creation, we have Eden. So Genesis 1 and 2. And we are at this level. We are in relationship with God. Then sin comes along. Genesis chapter 3 and the fall happens and we descend away from God. But the rest of the Bible is a God is God's regen, redemption trajectory leading us back to relationship with him, leading us back to Eden. The biggest point of which is when Jesus went to the cross and took away our sin. The human history since that point, since the fall onwards, has all been about restoring and redeeming us so that we can once again be in relationship with God. Um, in 1 Peter 2, to verse 24, it says, He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By wounds, by his wounds, we've been healed. We're dying to, by his wounds, by him going to the cross, we are dying to sin and the consequences of sin so that we can live to righteousness. We have been healed by his wounds. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. There is a consequence to sin, but Jesus comes to bring us eternal life. Jesus comes to correct the problem of sin. Jesus comes to counter the, the uh, cultural effects of sin, to remove those effects of sin. Even in Matthew 6, verses 9 to 10, when Jesus was asked by his followers to teach, him how, teach them how to pray, he says, pray this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're to pray for and long for and hope for and aspire to a time when the kingdom of God is on earth like it is in heaven. Right now on earth, as a result of the fall, we have sin. But we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is not are uh, called not to not to live in the sin, not to dwell in the sin, but to aspire to a different kingdom. We're just called to aspire to the kingdom of God. A place where there is no more hatred, no more pain, no more tears, no more sin. And from what we've seen in Genesis chapters one and two, no more patriarchy. Why? Because that was born as a result of our sin. Does that make sense? That was born as a result of our sin. I'm going to finish in a moment. I'd love the worship team to come and join me. Now, because through our study of Genesis and of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see that sin uh, is what caused man to be subject to, uh, woman to be subject to man and man to be subject to the ground. And we know that the gospel from that point onwards is, is a story of God redeeming us and, and returning us to the way things were, for, seeking for his kingdom to be on earth as it is in heaven, we know, we know that that means that God wants the consequences of sin to be removed. He even went to the cross to remove our sin from us. He took our sin on himself when he went to the cross. And then beyond that, the consequences of sin, he, want, he wants that to be removed too. Do we see that? Can you guys see that in the text? He wants us to be restored to what he created us for. He loves us. He loves you. Whether you're watching online or whether you're in the room, he loves you so much that he does not want to be separated from you by your sin. But that's the result of sin. But he loves you so much that he went to the, the incredible lengths of going to the cross, of going through that horrific death, uh, Crucifixion wasn't just execution, it was worse than that. It was, it was a horrific, horrible, painful, shameful death. And he went through that in order to remove our sin and the consequences of sin, which is death and many other bad things. And he takes away our sin. And therefore, if we accept that and say yes to Jesus, we're living a new way. We're not living 
bond, under the bonds of our sin anymore. We've been set free from our sin. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. We have been set free from our sin. We're set free from the punishment that we deserve because of Jesus on the cross. And then we're called to live the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. We're called to live in a way that isn't in bondage to sin, but is different. And I believe that affects everything. I believe that affects every area of our lives. And I also believe that it affects the way and the role of women. If women, this is probably the boldest thing I'll say today. And trust me, I am just I'm just easing us in gently to this series. It's gonna go, it's gonna go deep after this. This was the sh- this is the shallow end. Um, but I, I think, right, if women in the ch- are equal to men in the church, if we say that there are roles that women are not allowed to have in church simply based on gender, exclusively based on gender, that's going against how God created things. And that is dwelling in sin. Something that was started by sin, we are holding on to. And there's only two reasons that I can think that we would do that. Number one is Jesus' death and resurrection failed to redeem women. Because if women haven't been redeemed and, and uh, the patriarchy, patriarchal hierarchy is a result of sin, well, then Jesus died and we believe that in church women are equal to men, then Jesus failed to redeem women. Or... We have to assume that God changed his mind and didn't want to redeem women. Let me be clear, neither of those are true. Neither of those are true. God didn't change his mind. God never changes the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus' death on the cross was for all things. It is finished, he declared. He didn't get up there and say, it's almost done. I did a good job. I'm 99% of the way to redeeming humanity. It's just the ladies who are stuck. No, that's not what Jesus said. That's not what his death was about. He died on the cross to heal us from all our sins, to take away all our sins. And since, since the hierarchy, the patriarchy, only began as a result of sin, we have to assume with confidence that it is through Jesus' death and resurrection that it is removed. And therefore, there can be no roles within the church which women are barred for exclusively because of their gender. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. I think that deserves, I like Simon's amen. I think that deserves an amen and a hallelujah. Not because of what I said, because of what God has done. We're going to go back into a time of worship. Can you stand with me? Let's pray. Now, you may have some questions. <laughs> it's likely you do. I'm more than happy to chat about it. I'd love to encourage you. This uh, message will be reposted on YouTube and there'll be a podcast on Spotify. I'd encourage you to listen to it again. It's There's a lot in it. And as I said, we're just dipping our toes in. So I'd, I would subscribe to the YouTube channel and to Spotify because the, the messages that are going to come in the next few weeks, they're going to require a couple of listens. But uh, yeah, let's pray. Let's pray now. I want to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father God, Father God, right now in this moment, we come before you knowing that you are the true and living God, knowing that you are holy, knowing that you are good, knowing that you are mighty, knowing that you are beyond our understanding, and knowing that you love us so much that you didn't want to leave us to be condemned by our own sin. In fact, you went to, you went to the greatest levels imaginable in order to take away our sin, and to rescue us and redeem us. God, I pray that today in this room or watching online, however we are feeling, that we will be able to look to you and look to the cross and know what it means for us that we are free from our sin. We're free because of your great love for us. Help us to live our lives knowing that in the light of the freedom you have bought us by going to our cross. I pray for the women of our church, I want to thank you for them. I want to thank you that they were not your second thought. <laughs> They're not something, uh, an idea you came to later. 
You created us, us in your image and your likeness to reflect you. I pray that if anyone in our church community or watching online has ever felt like they've been put down, told that they are less valuable because of their gender, told that they don't have the same worth as men, God, I pray you will heal them from that lie today and you will redeem them from that. And they will be able to walk in the truth that they were created in your image and likeness and that you love them. You made them on purpose. You've got a plan and purpose for their lives. God, I pray for healing, whole healing. And I pray for forgiveness for the church as well, for when we have done that. When we've used a microphone, a pulpit, to not proclaim the good news of the gospel, but to to have power over others. I'm sorry for that. I pray you'll forgive us as a church, as the church globally, for when we've done that. I pray all this in your name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's worship the Lord.